Hello, and thank you. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for our third panel. Um, we are excited to enter a slate of presentations about expanding broad support for underrepresented populations, particularly as they are um, as they are preparing to apply to law school um, and to submit competitive um, applications. And so without further ado, to make sure that our panelists have enough time to present, um, I will have uh, at the top each of our panelists introduce themselves, tell us about um, of course, as um, your institution and where you are broadcasting from today. Um, so let's start off with Jessica, and then after that, each of our panelists can introduce themselves, and then we'll prepare for your presentations. Hi, my name is Jess Finley. I'm at the University of Arizona, and currently I am in Dallas, Texas. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Elaine Chu, and I'm a member of the faculty at the law school at St. John's University in Queens, New York. And I'm also a director of the Ron Brown Center and Prep Program, and I'm broadcasting from Westchester, New York. Hi, my Hi. name is Camille. I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Camille Dean, and I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Fordham Law School, and I'm broadcasting from Long Island, New York. Hi, I'm Ida Vernon. I'm also with the Ronald Brown Prep Program with St. John's University School of Law in New York. I am the Program Coordinator for the Weekend LSAT Boot Camp, and I am also broadcasting from Queens, New York. I'm Beth Mertz. I'm at the American Bar Foundation. And I'm uh, speaking from Chicago, the traditional territories of the Three Fires people. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for introducing yourselves. Um, and so the way this will work is our presenters will um, present a little bit about their programs and their outcomes, um, and then it'll be followed by some comments or questions from myself, and then we'll move to audience comments. So while they are presenting, the beauty of this is that in real time, you can present your questions for them to answer at the end. So please pose your questions there. But we'll get started off with Jessica. Thank you. Um, and then I'm kind of new to this, so I just control the, can you all see my PowerPoint? Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, so my program uh, is the Latina program. It is a program geared at supporting Latinas in our BA in law program, which is an undergraduate law school um, uh, law degree. Um, so we focused on Latina, Latinas in particular, because they are um, underrepresented in the law, as you can see. Um, in addition, we also have some current pipelines, oops, at the university that um, my, uh, so one is the BA in law program, and it is remarkably diverse compared to a traditional JD program. Uh, approximately 25% of the students in the BA in law program are Latina. So that serves as one pipeline. In addition, U Arizona was designated a Hispanic serving institution in 2018, and that serves as another pipeline. So we wanted to capitalize on the success of these current pipelines by offering another pipeline um, through the Latina program. And uh, I, I know there's a lot of words on this slide, but I'll just summarize briefly. We were um, inspired by research on STEM education at, SS, um, at HSIs, which um, indicated that mentoring and advising were critical pieces to supporting um, Latinas in achieving higher education. Um, so we incorporated those into this program in addition, uh, another way we worked with the community was I created a committee, a small committee with Latina lawyers, and, and we did some outreach through surveys and, um, and discussion. 
to find out what types of um, education would have been helpful for for them in achieving their law degree if they it, you know what resources they would have wanted to have had as um, as students deciding to go to law school and so we incorporated those into this program The objective of the program was to conduct a randomized experiment uh, of, of the pilot to see if it was successful. Um, we looked at the population from the Latinas in the BA in law program. Uh, the students needed to have at least a 2.75 GPA and we took um, all classmen but freshmen. Um, we randomly assigned, uh, that left about 100, and then we randomly assigned uh, 50 to an experimental group and 50 to a treatment group um, using an intent to treat design. Um, in this time, um, so we randomly recruited, randomly assigned, and then we um, in extensively recruited for the 50 in the experimental group. We ended up with 18 students, um, 20 students uh, initially enrolled in the course out of the 50 invited, um, but two did not complete. We did a lot of recruitment using um, emails, postcards, and phone calls and texts. Um, so we initially sent uh, several multiple emails um, asking students to en enroll in the program. Um, we had a special invitation from Marla Franco, who is the assistant vice provost for our HSI. And then uh, we followed up with postcards and the phone calls and texts. Other things we did to recruit students was offer the course for credit um, so that that would not be a barrier to some students who had to work um, and, were, and could only participate in the course if it was offered for credit. Um, we also encountered a, a little bit of a snag um, with, with scheduling and a lot of the students um, were not able to attend the initial um, class time. So we ended up offering uh, two sections of the course. Oh, this slide did not come out well. Um, well, that's, that's too bad. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, uh, you don't have a good visual, but I'll just briefly summarize the, the um, education components. Um, we had uh, four primary objectives, and one was goal setting, and that included growth mindset, as well as encouraging students to start to um, research what career or professional or graduate goals they wanted to achieve. Um, the next piece was professional um, identity formation, and we used mentoring um, and panel discussions to encourage students to start to build a professional identity. Um, we then focused on wellness, and wellness included both um, stress management as well as financial well, wellness and um, culture and um, diversity and inclusion as a piece of, of this component. And then um, I'm, let me just refer to my notes real quick because I'm drawing a brief blank on the last one. Um, Oh, in application. So applications was a critical piece, and that included um, having, um, like, learning what materials they needed to have, um, how to navigate the application process to law school, and it included a test component. And we were all able to provide through Access Lex funding um, access to a GRE or LSAT prep course um, as part of the course, and that was at no cost to the students. Um, we had wonderful luck recruiting our mentors using that, um, the, the, you know, the little small committee I created. Um, we were able to get a lot of outreach and had many, um, many people willing to participate as, as mentors. Um, so we were able to do one-to-one -one mentoring. So each mentor had one mentee. Um, the women that volunteered to be mentors were all women of color and they all had diverse careers. Um, we had three judges participate as well as lawyers and academics in the community. 
And I also want to highlight that they all received training on the how to be a good mentor as part of this um, uh, as part of this work in recruiting. Um, we wanted them to receive training on motivational interviewing and goal setting, as well as um, help with help them with communication and defining the roles and expectations in their mentor mentee relationship. So we have some positive results that I'd like to share. Um, we ended up needing to use propensity score matching, which basically um, has our Latino participants and then a comparable group of uh, peer comparison group, which you can see in column in the second column here. Um, so the Latinas, um, I just want to highlight uh, uh, how they are similar. So for both groups were all women, all um, Hispanic ethnicity, and they were largely BA in law students. Um, and then you, you, I, I think the slides will be made available, so you should be able to look more closely at the other similarities. Um, we were not able to recruit to the extent we wanted to, so we are. Um, uh, so it is, so we were not able to run the analysis we wanted to, but we did still see positive results. Um, so here, just to highlight, um, when we asked students about their interest in pursuing a career as an attorney, 94% um, of Latinas said they were interested in pursuing a career as an attorney versus 72% of their peers. And we see this um, further demonstrated when asked about their other professional interests in law-related um, professions. Um, again, just to highlight government, 67% of Latinas were interested in a career in government, government just uh, versus 44% of their peers. We also asked um, Latinas and their peers about steps they'd taken for, towards law school, and we see that um, many more of the Latinas had um, taken steps towards law school compared to their peers. Um, again, I'd just like to highlight the column in the middle that 61% of the Latinas had enrolled in a prep course um, versus 22% of their peers. Um, and that 100% of the Latinas had uh, talked to a lawyer versus 72% of their peers. Um, and then in terms of the materials and their preparation um, in, in that regard, we also see that um, Latinas had, were further along in completing materials. Um, again, 94% had completed their resume versus 61% of their peers. Um, and resources that helped the students were, were mentoring, which was a critical piece of the program. Um, and 94% of the Latinas indicated that mentoring was helpful for them um, versus none of the peer group indicated mentoring. And I think, I think I'm out of time, so. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to? Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, we did have some really positive qualitative feedback that um, I'll let you all read on when the slides are posted um, and, and I can talk about more later. Wonderful. Thank you, Jess. Um, now we will move on to our group from the Ron Brown Prep Program. Thanks to everyone. Um, we're going to try our best to kind of each take the turns and speak during the 10 minutes. Um, I just want to say that our program is really probably best captured a little bit by the, its title. We called it uh, the Weekend LSAT Boot Camp. And we basically designed it for adult learners. Um, and so uh, I wanted to just say our inspiration was really having been in the pipeline space for, you know, close to two decades now, um, what we've been trying to do with the Ron Brown prep program is really be innovative and focused in where we um, intervene in the pipeline um, and in demographics. And so we decided to 
Pitch to Access Lacks an Adult Learner Program. So I'm going to um, let our program coordinator, Ida Vernon, take it from here. Thank you, Elaine. Um, yeah, so this was a very novel program within the diversity pipeline space in focusing on adult learners. And what do we mean by adult learners? So all the students were um, already uh, had already achieved at least a bachelor's. In some instances, we had a few who had master's degrees. Um, I think the most significant um, and interesting thing about this group was the diversity of age and learning experience. So let me give you some statistics about um, how we went about that relate to how the, the cohort was um, composed. So we received about 70 applications, which was way more than we expected because when we kicked this off in December, um, in the, right around holiday time, we got very few. We had to extend the um, deadline application. We thought, gee, who are we gonna get? Um, and we got way more. We originally thought we'd have uh, 20 spots, we expanded it to 24, so um, we had to reject quite a number of qualified applicants. The applicants were overwhelmingly female, and part of that dovetails with the fact that we targeted paralegals and legal um, support professionals who are largely a, a female population. Uh, we ended up with an overwhelmingly female cohort, not surprisingly, out of 24. 21 were female, three male. Uh, the age diversity ranged from 21, and uh, we did have some very recent class of 2020 uh, college graduates, 21 through 56. Uh, out of the 24 that we started out with, um, eight were over age 30, and they ranged from 31 to 56. So in, in looking to compose this cohort, I, I was the one tasked with reviewing the applications and, and making the, um, the acceptance um, decisions. Um, we knew it was gonna be challenging. Weekends are gonna be challenging people, especially for working adults who also may be juggling family responsibilities. So I was looking in their um, personal statements of interest um, for evidence of resilience, uh, determination, uh, resourcefulness, people who could handle this kind of schedule, which originally was going to be um, Saturdays, six months straight of Saturdays. I think it was 25 Saturdays. And um, I, I think we, we did get that ultimately. Um, out of the 24, uh, only one withdrew fairly late in the program, and that was actually an applicant in her 20s. So, you know, I, I do want to um, just really highlight that as a salient feature of this program age diversity, life experience diversity, and resilience. Um, an, another thing we look to do here, which we had done in other Ron Brown programs that are focused on undergraduates, or what we kind of refer to the team, uh, Camille, Elaine and I, is wraparound services. And this is, uh, with the undergraduate programs that we run in the summer, typically um, we would follow up, or at least the last few years um, since I've been involved, um, on staff, I'd follow up with them during the academic year to see how their progress, um, what their course mix was, how they felt about um, applying to law school, what they were doing in preparation for that. Uh, with the adult learners who have already graduated college, we kind of folded them in. So there was a lot of uh, what I would say is uh, intensive pre-law counseling that kind of came with this. Um, so that, that's basically what I would say overall about the selection process and um, the, you know, the idea of constructing this for adult learners. So Elaine, Camille, anything that you want to add on that? Um, I think what makes sense is for us to kind of move on to outcomes, if that's okay with everyone. And so, um, you know, one metric that Ida just shared with us was how many people stayed in the program. And again, we did really well with that. Only one student has withdrawn in the lab over the four months that we've been running the program so far. But there are other metrics, and these are definitely metrics that Access Lex as our funder and all of those us in the audience are, are interested in. And so um, how many have ended up actually taking the LSAT? So, so far, seven people out of the original 24 have taken the LSAT. They took it in um, this past October and November. Um, and the average increase in their scores when we compared their initial diagnostic to their actual LSAT score was 
29 points. So seven people have taken it. So far, it's a small sample, but they're showing a really nice point increase. Um, the remaining folks, 17 folks, their intent is to take it in January. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, um, well, that was a little bit later than we had designed or hoped for, why that ended up being the case. But we are very, very, um, I think, uh, positive that these 17 will go on and be actual test takers. The other outcome that I wanted to share with you guys, and we went really old school, so I'm just gonna do this. Can you guys see some of that? The other outcome that I wanted to focus on um, was, you know, uh, what their initial test scores were, what patterns we saw, and also what their average score increase was. And this is now looking at whether they took the actual LSAT or their highest diagnostic score with us. So far, they've taken about 10 diagnostics with us. Um, so I wanted to kind of focus on the middle column. The middle column, you'll see that in uh, the top row, what you see is essentially the initial score for the entire cohort of 24. The average initial score was a 138. What you'll see in the second row is um, a higher number, 141. That was the average initial diagnostic score for everyone who was out of college for less than two years. So our greener, younger, tends to be younger participants. The number in red, a 137, were for the students who had been out of college for anywhere between three to 10 years. And then the final black number on the bottom row, right, a 135, was for our students who had been out of college anywhere between 11 to 26 years. And that middle column basically captures a pattern, which is the longer you've been out of college, the more likely it is that your initial diagnostic score is going to be lower, right? That there's a kind of inverse effect there. The um, final metric that I wanted to share with you is really uh, the last column on this whiteboard, which is average score increase. Again, where we could, we would take their initial diagnostic and compare it to an actual LSAT. Where we couldn't, we compared that initial diagnostic to their highest diagnostic. So, you know, post-January, this will be a comparison to actual diagnostic, excuse me, actual LSAT scores. But we wanted to point out a pattern again. The top row, if you look at the entire cohort, so far they've shown a score increase of 10.75 points. When you break it down by how long they've been out of school, the blue row, if they've been out of school for two years or less, they showed an average increase of 6.3 points. If they were out of college for three to 10 years, the red number, they showed an average increase of 12.55 points, almost doubling, right, the younger kids. And then finally, the, the bottom row, for those who had been out of school 11 to 26 years, they showed an increase of 15.75 points. Now, there's a pattern there too, right? It seems to show that the people who've been out of school longer have a higher right score increase. There's a lot of um, explanations for this. Uh, we just wanted to share these metrics with you because we wanted to take advantage of that age diversity, which made our kind of program special. But that's all I have for outcomes to share. I'll just pick up with um, thinking about really reaching the non-traditional student. We had to recognize that a lot of them were coming to us with bachelor degrees that they had obtained 10 plus years ago. And so we could not take the same approach that we utilized in working with college students who were already in the swing of things with study skills and their writing skills that in hindsight, we would implement a pre-session course to really drill down on critical thinking skills, analytical ability, and most importantly, writing skills, because we found that those were areas that really um, did not uh, level out with where they needed to be with that first diagnostic on the LSAT. 
we recognized that there was a lot of kind of background training that needed to happen before they could actually get into the full intense LSAT course. And so if we had to do things again, recognizing that these students may have been out of higher ed for quite some time, we would step back with a pre-session before going into the full session for this course. But overall, we were very proud of the accomplishments of our students. Many of them were single parents uh, working full time and showed a tremendous amount of grit and determination in completing the program. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. I look forward to diving more into your program and your outcomes in the Q&A. Our last presenter is Beth and I will give her the, the airspace. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, great. Okay, I just wanna start by saying I'm so grateful to Access Lex and my home institution, the American Bar Foundation for supporting this project, which is building on, but also breaking away from previous studies that I and others have been doing on the Legal Academy using more traditional methods. So in this project, I'm working with a varied group of law professors to identify how their voices and those of their students have been heard or silenced in, the U in US law schools. Allowing the people in the study to guide the data collection has really, for me, highlighted the limitations of some of our traditional quantitative and even qualitative methods, although we need those too, so I don't want to uh, be uh, negative about that. But sometimes our traditional methods actually repeat the silencing that's regularly imposed by the institutions we're studying, which is uh, unfortunate. So a case in point, uh, I'm covering a lot of different groups in this study, but I'm going to focus today on Native American law professors and law students. Our traditional methods too often require there to be a critical mass of a certain group in order for us to even acknowledge, let alone study them. And this has had the result of erasing smaller groups from studies altogether. Or when we use standardized interviewing, interviewing techniques, we sometimes minimize our chance of capturing the unique aspects of different, differently situated minoritized people including when situations differ because of intersectionality. So I wanna just uh, shout out to Mira Deo, whose pathbreaking work has been one of the lights guiding us and she'll be in the panel um, after this, um, showing us new ways of approaching this kind of science, social science research. Her intersectional approach affected both her methodology and how she analyzed her data and obviously the theory she used in designing the study. And it's a perfect example of how more inclusive frameworks can also lead to better science. Because we're, you know, studies of the legal profession and the legal academy to date have generally omitted consideration of Native American lawyers, law professors, and law students altogether, which is argue and I I have been among those people, and that's arguably a scientific flaw, right, in that we then disregard a group of people with significant positioning regarding the U.S. legal system and, and should be also regarding um, the legal educational system. But Mira's intersectional approach focused her data collection on women of color from many backgrounds, including indigenous women law professors, and that was just an eye opener to me. So building from her and other critical race theory work and also drawing on linguistic anthro research on voice, I'm working with autobiographical narratives, interviewing, observation of classes and academic events and text analyses to develop better insight on the range of experiences of traditionally excluded peoples in law school. And as I said today, I'm just gonna focus on some initial findings on work completed today that focuses on the Native American experiences. So a few bullet points. One, while there are no historically indigenous mainstream law schools in the United States, there are law schools that have more and less welcoming atmospheres for Native American law students. And that leads to very different reported experiences. 
for those who had more positive experiences, and this comes as no surprise, I think, to people who are working in this area, it makes a lot of difference if there are indigenous law professors and a critical mass of indigenous students at that school. Um, and also a curriculum that focuses on Native American law and experience. Two, the reports of Native American law student and professor experiences collected to date contain a greater focus on the importance of geography and place than is found in reports from other groups. And again, this can guide people in how, what they include in quantitative research as well, or what kinds of things they focus on in programs for students. Um, proximity to tribal lands and homes is often mentioned as an important factor for students and professors in their choices of the law schools they'll attend and then choose to teach at. Three, because both the existence of critical mass cohorts and proximity to tribal lands can be important for indigenous law students and professors, their choices will often run contrary to the received wisdom in U.S. official hierarchies of law schools. And we see this with other minoritized um, law students as well. I just want to point out that this is similar and different. And I think we want to pay attention to both and start disaggregating a little bit the just group of students that are so often lumped as students of color altogether. So the uh, the... You know, the priorities in the official rankings as Access Lex well knows because they've been working on this may be considerably less desirable for students of color. And this is certainly true for indigenous law students and professors. That exacerbates the already race-based negative implications of those hierarchies. And this in turn affects, of course, the possibility that indigenous scholars can have impact on what's thought of as core curriculum and scholarship, especially at a national level in the legal academy. Uh, for, like many outsider law professors, um, indigenous law professors can face disproportionate service obligations within law school communities because they wind up seeming accessible not only to minority students, so min minoritized students, but also to white students, and they care about those students and they respond to them. In the case of some Native American professors, there's even a further service time demand that arises because of their desire to help their own and other tribal communities in the face of severe ongoing legal needs. And the needs are, are uh, very serious. So this extra service, while arguably crucial, and, and this is a huge point to talk about, how all this unseen service work on the part of so many minoritized professors undergirds a system of credibility for law schools um, in, the, in the national scene is given, as we know, very little credit in terms of even local, let alone national systems of assessment and honor. So, you know, five, this brings us to a longstanding problem that other people are working on and noticing, certainly Access Lex. I know CJ, who just spoke, has been working on alternative rankings. He and I have been part of a working group um, through the AALS and, um, and the Law and Society Association trying to challenge and work with uh, the U.S. News and World Report and Hein Online um, to try to challenge this national level of increasingly skewed valuation and evaluation that systematically undermines inclusion of marginalized peoples, values, scholarship, and thought, which paradoxically, as Guinier and Torres warned us years ago, um, were we to pay attention to it, might help save a foundering set of institutions were they able to upend some of these hierarchies that keep them from adopting a broader intellectual, but also ethical lens. So while the reported experiences of indigenous law students and professors in the U.S. share many features in common with other traditionally marginalized groups, they also speak to the importance of considering the different positions of people among and between those groups. And we know that the standard approaches that we often have to adopt to get um, 
statistical validity um, when we lump people of color together for methodological and other reasons, we risk entrenching a white centric perspective that homogenizes all people just on the basis that they don't share white privilege. And that's a scientific as well as an ethical problem. Now, as I go on, I'm hoping to attend to better to many of the intersectional issues here, including gender. Um, our deliverables, I'll just say very quickly, include um, trying to generate ways of incorporating these uh, more sensitive perspectives in collaboration with traditional quantitative and qualitative studies. Um, something that California Supreme Court Lou, um, Justice Liu has been working on from the point of view of uh, studying Asian lawyers. Um, we also want to continue to press the U.S. News and World Report and the mainstream academy to pay attention to these alternative ways of framing merit and to try to work against the growing entrenchment of um, this really meritless approach to hierarchy. And finally, our plan involves dissemination directly to deans and legal education policy movers and shakers um, and platforms through the AALS, the American Bar Foundation, the Law and Society Association, and the New Legal Realism Coalition to get the word out, as well as, of course, outreach to empirical critical race and critical race theory scholars. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for uh, those comments and those very um, and reasonable insights as it relates to how we evaluate and um, even um, assess um, various groups um, who would want access to, to legal education, um, higher education at large, and how even our assessments themselves may overlook certain groups. So now we are moving into our um, formal Q&A session. So if you have any additional questions, um, the audience, feel free to start putting those there. I will start off with a few of my own. Um, so the first question that I have is, I know that we, um, we rushed through um, your projects, which are very detailed and complex. Um, and so to offer you uh, each more time to talk about the process of developing your program or projects, um, could you um, in greater detail describe um, for us, how did you formulate your ideas or draft proposal for your existing projects, particularly for those who are attending, who are thinking about um, developing their own programs to get at some of these issues that you've talked about. Um, and uh, additionally, did you reach out to internal or external stakeholders as you were developing your programs or research projects? Um, so feel free to, to take turns going. <laughs> Um, I, I can start. Um, I, I worked closely with both internal and external stakeholders, um, and I was really grateful for both in, um, both sets of input. So initially, I reached out to um, people I knew on campus who worked in the HSI, and they were able to offer me um, a lot of good guidance on how to go about developing the program and, and some good research that they had access to. Um, and then I did involve uh, community stakeholders by um, starting with like the small committee of, of Latina lawyers in the, in the community. And then we did do a survey of the Latina lawyers um, in the community through their contacts in order to get um, input from the community in developing the program. Um, some of the other campus resources I was able to tap into included um, reaching out to the athletic department to conduct the mentoring training. Um, the athletic counselors uh, at, uh, on campus were familiar with motivational interviewing and goal setting. So they were the ideal candidates um, in, well, in their work with athletes. Um, those come up a lot. 
So they were ideal candidates to conduct the mentoring training. Um, so that's that's another cross-campus collaboration that I was able to use. I will just quickly say um, when we were thinking about this program through an extension of the Ron Brown prep program work that we were already doing, we were able to achieve buy-in institutionally both at the law school but also the university. Um, it was important that we were good stewards of our community and in doing that we wanted to have outreach to communities that were traditionally underserved, mostly women and women of color. And so through our contacts within the community, both uh, within New York City, but also with our university and uh, reaching out to even employees who were working, um, you know, to make our college and, and university a great place for other students, also had dreams to become uh, more and do more and become lawyers and attorneys. And so to open up the doors of the law school to really be a sanctuary for so many non-traditional students who did not have a place to go, who had no other options when it came to pre-law preparation, this was a, an amazing partnership between St. John's and uh, the Access Lex funded programming. So I definitely wanted to make a note about uh, institutional buy-in is so important. Um, I would just like to say it's been really my privilege to work with this group of remarkable students, particularly women, women of color, um, who have had some really inspiring um, life stories that I've been very moved by. I mean, we, when I talked about age, that did not entirely reflect um, their journeys to get to even college. We have a 50-year-old student who just graduated college this year. And uh, I wish I had time to tell more of her story, but uh, there's not the, the form, but uh, that's just to give you an example of the caliber of individual who would apply for this kind of program and aspires relatively later in life to a career in the law. I would add that uh, creating streams of information that go directly from the voices of minoritized students and professors into our collective planning and into the mainstream of uh, the legal decision-making in law schools that deans and other people have access to would be important because um, even published accounts are full of stories like, um, you know, we were just hearing about of, of resilience and incredible fortitude in uh, getting through law school and getting to the ranks of law professors by minoritized um, law students. And so the information is actually out there and we're hoping to help uh, put it into a form that people can access more easily to hear more of those kinds of stories and understand them. Yeah, that is so important that, um, you know, when thinking about putting these programs together, actually hearing from the students themselves, those that you would actually be serving. Um, and I think that, um, I think Jess mentioned this as well, hearing um, what resources do they feel are lacking um, and what resources uh, would be helpful for future cohorts within the particular program that maybe were overlooked in the first iteration of the same program. Um, and so related to this idea of um, how do you frame your program and even um, how do you engage with stakeholders? One of the audience members asked, um, particularly in response to, I think one of you had 18 participants in your program, um, what different recruiting efforts did you, um, beyond what you actually employed, what different recruiting strategies would you employ in hindsight now that you've gone through an iteration of the program? Um, that, that's hard. Um, I, I think for any research design, um, recruitment is a challenge. Um, is, and it, it's a little bit different when, uh, from my perspective, trying to do like a randomized uh, clinical trial for the pilot evaluation versus like just opening up to everyone. Um, I think we definitely could have had more participation using the recruitment methods that we um, implemented. 
but uh, trying to, to keep our experimental design. Um, you know, I think what, so I think what we did was actually quite successful, um, even though 18 doesn't seem like a large number, um, but 18 out of 20 and um, having only two drop out, I think does show that, that it, it was uh, successful in that students, because um, for those of you less familiar with research, like uh, retention is also a huge issue in research. Um, and so having 90% of the participants complete is actually pretty exciting. Um, but I do think the, I, from my experience in other research projects, um, multiple points of contact is critical. Um, as you may recall from my slides, having um, not only the emails, having someone who is uh, being kind of influential, even like a law professor, um, you know, who is Latina, or in, in my case, we used our, um, the vice provost of the Hispanic um, serving institution to reach out um, in a request. I think those points of contact are also critical. Um, and then following up, we use uh, the, the mail uh, with the postcard mail to them. And, and then I, I did receive some follow up um, from those students who actually did not enroll, but they um, emailed or um, to tell me that they got the postcard and they um, would love to have done the program, but they couldn't for scheduling reasons. Um, so even the, even though that doesn't that seems a little antiquated in today's society, that that I did get a couple of responses um, even from people that didn't participate, um, and and then also trying to accommodate, trying to be aware of potential barriers. Like um, when I was working with the vice provost of the HSI, she was really um, encouraging us to find ways to make it uh, for credit or, and not just like a voluntary thing because for students who do have to work and, and can't, can't really take um, classes that aren't for some kind of purpose, like a credit, um, it could be a barrier to participation. So we definitely did a lot to try to recruit um, out of the, the 50 in our experimental group. Um, so hopefully I answered that question, but. Um, I'll just say very briefly that I think recruitment is um, a different challenge depending on what you're trying to do. I think as Jess Finley just said, hers being a clinical experimental kind of um, program, it was different. Um, we have seen that, you know, we've had to, be uh, creative and, and doing differential kind of recruiting, depending if we were launching, as we did here, an adult learner program, we, you know, got into the websites and the different social media groups of like paralegal associations, you know, um, we tried to tap into our own law schools, um, you know, connection with uh, perhaps other, we used to run a night school at the law school. So we had some kind of existing networks as well, but, you know, it's very different from when, you know, a few years back, we launched an all male, all men of color program, which was very different um, and, and very tough to recruit for as well. And so I just think each one has its own thing. Um, and, you know, the first year is always the hardest year. I, I think that's the other thing. Um, recruitment gets a little bit easier with um, each passing year. And it's just, you know, the hope is that many of the effective, impactful programs will go from year to year and be sustained. But that's that's the hard part as well. I would just um, add that I was actually surprised that recruitment wasn't difficult here, that there seemed to be a hunger and unmet demand um, as demonstrated by the fact that we got about three times as many applications for each spot. And since it was the first uh, program, I'm sure we could figure out ways to actually cast a broader net um, for this cohort and probably get even more applicants. And also I would just add, talking about underrepresented communities, um, very often times is an information gap. And so we have to do just even further outreach to ensure that we're getting through to those communities. And sometimes it's, 
non-traditional approach. It's, you know, contacting the local colleges and universities, the local community groups to just let them know that we have this program, getting the word out um, via social media, again, with the digital divide, uh, may not accurately uh, you know, get to this group. And so it's important to have a multifaceted system of recruitment that really focuses on engaging uh, students who have traditionally been shut out of legal education. And so we're going to have to think about innovative and creative ways to get through and get our messaging across. I mean, again, I um, I defer to the others on the panel, except um, on the point of recruiting for research on the sensitive issue of uh, what atmospheres are like in law schools for minoritized professors and students. And in that regard, I just say it's always been something we needed to be very careful about, but is especially so now in COVID. I have not. I have basically not observed some classes I could have observed because of my concerns about the vulnerability of uh, professors and students of color and also an added urgency now to make sure that we're giving back um, and, and uh, contacting people appropriately in a time when they're under such pressure. So one of um, the questions that I have, which is about sustainability. And I think that some of you touched on this, thinking about the sustainability of your programs or even your research project in the context of we're in this online space. And so Beth just mentioned the difficulty given the pandemic of, uh, and even sensitivity to observing certain courses classes when we're in this context. Um, and so if, if each of you could speak to um, how do you anticipate sustaining your programs moving forward, um, given the context that we are in, and what sort of challenges um, have presented themselves um, when it comes to sustaining your programs, uh, particularly for those, again, who are thinking about implementing these sort of programs at their institutions? So, so from, from my program, um, one way it is sustainable is we took a flipped classroom approach, which um, provides the instruction via video um, for the most part prior to class. And then the class time was used for, um, for actual in, interactive and engaging um, activities or for panel discussions. Um, and this actually did help because we were mid-semester when um, the school moved to online and we um, had to quickly adapt um, it, with the, the COVID pressures. Um, and so having in the videos already online, students were able to access those um, and we were able to easily move to like the more synchronous components of the course, which were like panel speakers. Um, so it, it was, we did have to get creative, um, but having these materials online um, definitely keeps the, the course sustainable. Um, and then we, having the it for credit as well, um, allows students who do need financial support for it to be like um, tuition or financial aid um, supported um, for participating in the, in the program. Um, so, so those were two ways I see in creating a, a sustainable um, program. And, and, and I'll, I will say having support of the institution and it does make a difference. And I think seeing um, the numbers, uh, like the results of the program, the evaluation component um, does encourage um, that support from the institution in keeping the program ongoing. Um, I think sustainability is a topic at every single one of your symposiums every year, <laughs> right? So, um, but I, I do think the pandemic has um, been helpful in some ways um, in the sense that it, at least uh, it reduced some of the actual cost of things, um, which was like just an odd, you know, thing to experience. But what remained constant for us was the amount of labor and love that 
uh, the program still took even across virtual platforms. So Ida Vernon, we uh, designed this program with her in mind as the program coordinator because she was um, so experienced from our in-person programs, but um, also really uh, committed lots and lots of hours to do that um, pre-law advising that she did. And it's just a lot of time. Um, and of course, time could be money because time is related to staffing. So um, I, I think the final thing I'll share is that at least in New York City, our, what I am really joyful about this year as opposed to a year ago is that I feel like a lot of um, other organizations are now coming into this space of um, working in the pipeline, whether it be high school students, college students, haven't quite yet seen adult learners, but I'm hoping to be copied. Um, but so most recently, uh, we have seen the New York City Bar Association get really busy um, the, uh, to start a multi-year college student pipeline program and fundraising for that. And we're like, thank God, you know, um, we've been waiting for this. And so they have access, right, to firms. They have access to individual attorneys in a way that we don't. Um, and so we really applaud that and support that. Um, we need kind of strong umbrella organizations to do that. Um, I think another group that we happen to partner with this summer is also getting involved. They're a bit of a local group, but it's, um, a, you know, it's the Justice Sonia Sotomayor um, Judicial Internship Program. And they long have had programs for high school students and law students, but next summer they're hoping to get into the college space as well. And um, so I, I think it's getting more people, more different kinds of umbrella organizations. It, it is hard for one law school to do it. I think we've been led by an amazing dean, Dean Michael Simons. Um, but, you know, it, it is very hard to sustain. And so that's what I would say. I, I, I feel positive about this moment that we're in, though. <laughs> All right. Thank you to um, all of our panelists for answering that. It's a tough question um, and it's an important question given the context that we are in. Uh, thank you to the panelists for your insights on the program. Your programs span a variety of issues. Research also spans a variety of issues and there's never enough time. Um, how do we effectively increase access um, and use interventions to make um, access to legal education um, accessible? It would take us days to really unpack everything. So thank you to everyone in attendance. I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah.